It really was beautiful. Remember that message when we get to the sermon. Good morning. Glad to see all of y'all this morning. You've left Francis over here all by herself. <laughs> it's all good. Um, in terms of our prayer list this morning, I did talk to Pat Hux, and uh, Pat has does not have COVID, does not have RSV, does not have flu, but she has a respiratory issue that's just hard to shake. And she's been to the doctor and it's, um, she's okay, but just still weak and um, 
didn't think she was gonna be able to get here, but she's she's good. She wanted everybody to know she was good, and um, so we just need to you know keep her in our prayers, and that we'll see her. But <clears throat> it's <clears throat> it's that time of year, isn't it? <laughs> it's just that time of year. Let's start, let's try to keep it here and above, okay, and keep it from going down into our chest. Um, in terms of um, new ads, uh, we're going to add a uh, friend of Gwen's, Linda uh, Tomana, who is on Tuesday going to have an adren adren adrenal gland. I can't even read my own handwriting. That's terrible. Adrenal gland removed. So um, we're going to add Linda to our prayer list um, this week and then on for her um, for her recovery. Uh, is there anybody else? Uh, keep praying for Betty's brother. She, he's still waiting for some tests. Isn't that a horrible time to be waiting for tests and, and waiting to you know hear the hear what kind of treatment? So it's just a really hard time. So we really need to lift him up in prayer um, while he waits to see um, to see what the doctors can do and what they're going to do. So please lift Don up um, in in your prayers. Uh, is there anyone else that we have any other updates or yes, sir? <laughs> Did you get permission to do that? I know we're getting to that, but I wasn't going to say that. So just let the record show Bruce did it. Bruce, <laughs> let the record show Bruce. <laughs> well, that's a joy, indeed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, <laughs> that is a joy. For sure, that's a joy. It is a definite joy. Um, do anybody else joys or um, concerns? Well, before we leave this moment, we're playing happy birthday. All right, Jerry, you ready over there? Did you did you did you understand we were talking about Betty's 80th birthday? Okay. <laughs> I'll take the deal. I'll take the deal. Austin, yes. I put a card for Jeffrey in the back. Oh. If everybody wants to sign it when they leave. Oh, great. Great. Thank you. If, if there's a card in the back for um, Jeffrey if you want to please sign it. Yeah, please sign it so he can hear from all of us. Uh, I forgot to ask you, Jerry, who's online with us? We have Annette. Annette. Okay. Good morning, Annette. Hello, Yeah, there's your circle yelling at you, and that's <laughs> um, okay. Then, in terms of our announcements, today the session meets after worship. Um, St. Columba is collecting, you know, foods as you know. So I've left that list out there. So anything that you are able to do would be greatly appreciated. Uh, to uh, this is the last Sunday. Okay. Um, Next Sunday is local relief taken during the worship service. On um, Saturday, the 9th of November. Wait a minute, have I got that right? Okay, 10. That's right. 9 November. I was doing the trying to do the math here. Um, and I don't have a pencil, so I can't do it without a pencil. Uh, all circles will meet at 10 a.m. in the social hall for a potluck brunch and Bible study. So um uh, that's Saturday at 10, the 9th of November. And then on 10 November, of course, we take up our, our NAM offering. Um, are there any other? Yes, ma'am. Don't forget fall back next week. Yeah, that's right, on the 3rd. Saturday. Saturday is the end of daylight savings time, so you have to fall back. Turn it back. Everybody call Barbara and remind her to turn her clock. <laughs> yes, thank you. Thank you, Missy. Anything else? 
All right, then, as Jesus has so graciously left his peace with each and every one of us, let us pass the peace of Christ to each other. So peace of Christ to all of you. Love of God is perfected in those who obey the word of Christ. Let us bow our heads in our opening prayer. Almighty God, your Son, our Savior Jesus Christ, is the light of the entire world. So may we, as your people, illumined by your word, shine with the radiance of his glory that he may be known worshipped and obeyed to the ends of the earth the one who loves us and reigns with you and the holy spirit one god now and forever amen god is present with us this morning he is calling us into worship so let us now call ourselves into worship using the call printed in our bulletin Remember who you are. Remember your calling. Remember who you are. Remember always. As we worship the living God, we remember all those who have walked the life of faith before us. They remind us not only of our triumphs, but also of our failures to be the people that God has called us to be and created us to be. With confidence that God is the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. Let us confess our sins to God and to each other using the prayer that is printed in the bulletin followed by a moment of silent prayer. Let us bow our heads together. Wait a minute, did I forget a hymn? Yes. Well, too bad, we'll do it after this. I'm on a roll now. Um, that's what happens when the hymn goes to the top of the next page, just for the record. So every time that happens. Well, then there you go. Okay, I feel better. Thank you, Betty, for, for jumping in. Um, the reason we're going to keep on going is because this prayer is a prayer written by one of the reformers, and today is Reformation Sunday. So this is a prayer that I found. And um, so think about it as we pray together to God and to each other, confessing our sins. Father, we praise and thank you for calling the reformers to recall your church to faith, grace, and your holy word. However, we too often fail to live up to the high calling of that reformation. You saved us through faith, and yet we try to earn your favor with works. You saved us by grace, and yet we cheapen your grace by using it as a license to keep sinning. You speak to us through scripture and yet we ignore your word and listen to the voice of the world. We acknowledge our unworthiness of your grace. We have sinned and continue to sin. 
both in what we do and what we fail to do. We are truly sorry and we repent. We turn away from sin and toward you, relying on your grace and strength to do what we cannot do on our own. So let's sing the hymn right now and then we'll have our silent moment and our declaration of forgiveness. So let's sing Martin Luther's Reformation hymn, A Mighty Fortress is Our God. It's in the blue number 260. Let us never forget you, O Lord, nor your goodness. 
Let the remembrance of your mercy be always engraved on our minds. Hear and believe this good news. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. <laughs> Now, open our hearts and our minds to the reading and the hearing of the Word of God. He is speaking to each one of us separately, individually. He is guiding each of us into His will so that we, as the body of Christ, can do His work. So, let us bow our heads together in our prayer for illumination. This prayer was also written by one of the original reformers. Almighty, eternal and merciful God, whose word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path, open and illuminate our minds that we may truly understand your word and that our life may be conformed to what we have rightly understood that in all our ways we may be pleasing to you. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Our first reading this morning is from Psalm, Psalm 34, verses 1 through 8. Let us hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul makes it boast in the Lord. Let the humble hear and be glad. Oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. I sought the Lord and he answered me and delivered me from all my fears. Look to him and be radiant so your faces shall never be ashamed. This poor soul cried and was heard by the Lord and was saved from every trouble. The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him and delivers them. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Happy are those who take refuge in him. Our second reading is from Romans chapter 3, verses 19 through 28. Now we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be silenced and the whole world may be held accountable to God. For no human will be justified before him by deeds prescribed by the law. For through the law comes the knowledge of sin. But now, apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been disclosed and is attested by the law and the prophets. The righteousness of God through the faith of Jesus Christ for all who believe. For there is no distinction since all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. They are now justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a sacrifice of atonement by his blood, effective through faith. He did this to demonstrate his righteousness because in his divine forbearance, he had passed over the sins previously committed. It was to demonstrate at the present time his own righteousness so that he is righteous and he justifies the one 
who has the faith of Jesus. Then what becomes of boasting? It is excluded. Through what kind of law? That of works? No, rather through the law of faith. For we hold that a person is justified by faith apart from the works prescribed by the law. May the Lord bless the reading and hearing of his word. Let us pray. May the words of our mouths and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, for you are our strength and our redeemer. Today is Reformation Sunday on the calendar of the church. This Sunday is not acknowledged in all Christian churches. That's a statement of fact, it's not a criticism. In the past on this Sunday, I looked back and I've delivered all kinds of sermons that I hoped would inform and educate us as Presbyterians, as Protestants in the branch of Christianity, because we are, as a denomination, Protestant, but also Reformed. And I'd hope that those sermons would help you appreciate that designation, if you will. Um, today I'm going to take a little bit different tact, maybe because maybe because the world seems a little crazy right now, maybe because there's just a lot of stuff happening and you hear a lot of stuff. So as I go along, I think you'll figure out the tact that I'm taking. So just hang on a little bit. You know, this church, this body of Christ, this that was started by that little group of apostles and the followers, we'll call them evangelists, the 12 and all the believers, it was started when they took off out of Jerusalem in fear of persecution, by the way, but also to take Jesus's charge to heart, to go out, to go out with the word, his word, his truth. And they went out and they established churches, big churches in Rome and Alexandria and Antioch and, and Jerusalem and Constantinople. They started this huge organization that we today know as Christianity. And I'm telling you, I think if Jesus were to walk in here and look at the chart that says Christianity, he'd probably be equally, if not more confused than we are at the complexity, the busyness of it. Followers of Christ, and then you just, Oh, the flow chart goes on and on. Go look it up. It's kind of fun. There are three major branches. This is not going to be, there's not going to be any test after this, but <laughs> there are three branches. And the first, the first thing you say is, wait, are there three different ways to be a follower of Jesus? I'm not being critical. I'm just, these are the questions that I ask myself. There is the Orthodox branch, and our neighbors are in the Orthodox branch. Our neighbors, St. Mary's Romanian Orthodox Church. There is the Catholic Church that you know as Roman Catholics. And then there's the Protestants. That's us. And then beneath Protestants, because not all Protestant denominations are Reformed, there's the Reforms. Now, one body of Christ, at least I hope so still, one body of Christ that have found their ways into these different legs of this chart because of differences. And, and I, I don't mean to sound critical, but this is my personal belief because people, men and women, as in humans, maybe not just humans, had differences in theology and in what's a sacrament and what's not and um, how you're saved and how faith and works and play into all of it because of those kinds of questions. 
And the very first split, it did take a little while, was in 1054, when the Orthodox and the Catholics split off. There was a Pope in Rome and there was a Pope in Constantinople. So now you got two, the Orthodox and the Catholics. At that time, we would be considered under the Catholic side. There were huge influences of Roman leadership and those um, in the what we'll call the Greek, Grecian world, um, Constantinople. Um, and that caused the leadership, caused the schism. Two became three, what we know now, when um, in 16th century, and I'll try, I'm going to try to be brief because would you believe there are volumes that the print is so small that there's no, there's no magnifying glass that helped you read it. But I'm going to try to be really, really brief to get you where I need you to be, to appreciate being reformed, which is what I'm trying to do. There's the Catholic Church, and in the 16th century, 15th, 1580s, there were very, very seriously devoted, faithful Christians who studied the word of God day and night. And they could do that because by then the Bible was in print, widely in print because of the invention of the printing press. And they would study it and they struggled these faithful Christians struggled with some of the practices of the Catholic Church. They struggled with the position and authority of the papal structure. They struggled with the words of Jesus and some of the words with Paul as they viewed some of the practices they were seeing about faith and about salvation. And some of them, like the names you know, very familiar, Martin Luther and John Calvin, they struggled as Christians with this burden of sin. I'm a sinful person. There's this, the burden of sin. They, they tried to work their way through how can I ever be justified? How can I ever be cleansed? made right with God. Those were all those words are the same. How can I get out from under this burden of sin? And ultimately, how can I be saved? How can I be saved? And on this Sunday, which the actual day is by the way, it's Halloween 31 October when it when the stuff really hit the fan with Martin Luther. On this Sunday, we particularly recognize the work of Martin Luther, a faithful, devoted Christian. And the postings that he finally put on the door of the Catholic Church, the postings that just were concerned, they were concerned about what they were doing with, particularly indulgences, which basically amounted to you could buy your salvation. You could buy it. But to state this very simply, and I'll ask, the, I'll ask for forgiveness from the, the saints above. In my mind, I think what Martin Luther and these reformers were wondering, where's Jesus? Where is Jesus in all of these practices? Where is Jesus? Where is God's glory? Where is God's grace? Where is God's word, where is it? And I think if they were here today, they might say, I guess we should have just stood up and yelled out loud, hold on, I think we've gotten off track here. Hold on, our salvation and our justification before God and our forgiveness. It's all about Jesus. It's that simple. It's all about Jesus. 
It's really that basic. And there are stories about how Martin Luther prayed day and night and read the Bible day and night. He was in this do loop of how do I get out of my sin? How do I do this? How do I get right with God? And I can only imagine how unsatisfying that must have been for a devout Christian and how easy it would be for him to feel no matter what I do, I cannot resolve my sinful nature. I can't resolve it before God. And he's absolutely right. It's sort of like a duh. You're right. You can't. You can't do it by yourself. You can't break that sinful do loop by sacrificing thousands of animals and shedding blood and confessing and confessing and confessing. You can't do it without Jesus. And while he read the scripture, remember he has the whole Bible, while he read the scripture and tried to understand God's justice and how he really does become justified before God and how he deals with his sinful nature, he reached this point where he had no confidence Seriously, there are, there are things written about him where he even contemplated suicide, that he was so distraught and, and, and he, he had lost his confidence that he could prevail on his merit alone. You kind of wish you were there where you could say to him, look, dude, you're on the right track. It's about Jesus. You're looking in the wrong place. And it was the words of the Apostle Paul that broke through while he was in this dire state of trying to figure it all out. It was the words that Paul wrote in Romans chapter 1. For in the gospel, think Jesus as a gospel, for in the gospel a righteousness from God is revealed. A righteousness that is by faith from first to last. Just as it is written, the righteous will live by faith. And that was a prophet, Habakkuk, who wrote, the righteous will live by faith. He had this moment where he realized, it is. It's all about my faith in Jesus. It's all about my faith in Jesus. It's Jesus. I need to be looking to. And he would later write, Martin Luther would say, that passage was my gate to heaven. And the gate was Jesus Christ. No one comes to the Father before me. Jesus alone, my faith alone. So cut out all this other stuff you're talking about. It's about your faith in Jesus, period. You know, I still ask myself how the word of God and the scriptures and the teachings of Jesus got us into these doctrinal and theological knots. I do, but I'm going to set that aside. That's me. This morning, I want you to rejoice in these reformers and what they basically did at that time in history what they did for the followers of Jesus of Nazareth. Let's not lose track whose church this is. I think that happens at times. This is Jesus's church. And these faithful Christians, believe me, these people that were then called Catholics, they were trying to inform the church that they felt had lost its way, not condemning them, but just they felt that they had lost their way, that these practices and indulgences and the, and the emphasis on sacraments and um, papal confessions were not what God really intended, not what Jesus really intended or taught. And these men felt like the church needed to come back to the basics. They never intended to cause a schism. That was not the point. These were faithful Christians. It was never about that. Their intent 
was to help bring the church back into the word of God. If they could have had a slogan or a bumper sticker, I really believe it would have said it's all about Jesus. It's all about Jesus. Sadly, Martin Luther was excommunicated. He didn't have a church anymore. He wasn't allowed in, literally. And so what did he do? He just kept going. He just kept going. His belief was so strong in how it was all about Jesus and faith in Jesus. He just kept going. He kept going. And so we have this Protestant branch of Christianity and part of the Reformed ideas. Now, over time, over time, not Martin Luther or the first of the Reformers, they would start to try and describe or, or um, define exactly what it was they're trying to say. Because they just started out trying to reform the Catholic Church. Next thing they know, they're out on the street with no church. So now these, these and this is all throughout Europe, in other places, trying to come together with what it is that they were trying to say. And so it eventually ended up that they had these foundations all about salvation, which means all about being justified before God. How do I get there? And so those are you are probably familiar with. Those were called the solas, meaning only or alone. The five statements about salvation. Now, keeping in mind that this all started because the, these original men um, couldn't find Jesus. They didn't think the church was putting Jesus first. So as you think about where they were coming from, what happened to Jesus, where's Jesus, you'll kind of see how that is comes through in the theme of these solas, in the way they tell you what is most important. There is the sola scripture, which is, hey, it is God's word alone, okay? Hey, it's about the Bible. It's about the word of God. That's the sole authority in the Christian life. Not prophets, not priests, not kings. God's word. God's word. That's your God. And there was sola faith. Faith alone. Faith. Faith. Faith alone. Being right with God being right with God, getting your record expunged, if you want to get legal about it, because justification is a legal term, getting your record clean of all your sins, getting your sins forgiven, it's through your faith in Jesus. It's through your faith in Jesus, period. Stop talking. And then there was sola gratia, which is grace alone. My gosh, honestly, Grace, I think we forget about it. Boy, talk about a powerful God's grace. Salvation is obtained and sinners are saved by the grace of God because they believe in Jesus Christ. So all that we believe, all the theology you want to talk about needs to be based on God's grace. For by grace you have been saved through faith in Jesus Christ. Paul was able to articulate that. By your faith in Jesus Christ, through the grace of God you're saved. Just got to have faith in Jesus Christ. And then there was the solo de gloria, which is everything is to the glory of God. Creation, salvation, our lives, Jesus' life as a human is all to the glory of God. And then sola Christo, in Christ alone. It's all about Jesus. No one comes to the Father except through me. No one comes to the Father except through me. Christ is the one and only mediator between you and God. I'm going to repeat it. It's important. Christ is the only 
one, the only one and only mediator between you and God. That says we have no need for other prophets. We have no need for other priests. We have no need for other kings to rule over Christ's church. He is the only mediator that you ever need. He is alone the object of our saving faith. And Christ is the linchpin of being reformed. Jesus. It's all about Jesus. Now, I'm going to share some scripture with you that, <laughs> believe it or not, no matter how many times you read the Bible, and I know many of you have read it often, there's always something that you say, man, I just don't remember that. Now, th this is not a test either, because many of us might fail it, including me. If someone walks up to you on the street and says, who is Titus? Would the first thing you say was, well, he's one of the writers in the New Testament. God bless you if you do get it right. It's a really small book. It's really small. We all don't know much about Titus. But I want to read something that he wrote that honestly, man, it's coming to the top of my list. He wrote, when the kindness and love of God our Savior appeared, he saved us. Not because of righteous things we had done, but because of his mercy. He saved us through the washing of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us generously through Jesus Christ, our Savior. So that, having been justified by his grace, we might become heirs having the hope of eternal life. Now, don't tell me that's not some good scripture. He got it all. It all. All justified by his grace, Jesus Christ. Paul wrote to the church, to the Colossians, Christ is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might have supremacy. Supremacy. It's all about Jesus. Period. He's your mediator. I can I can almost hear these these scriptures screaming out as these reformers as they're finally discovering that they've been going down the wrong rat hole. They've been in this do loop instead of realizing it was all about believing in Jesus Christ as their savior and through the grace of God. So the very big deal about the reformers is they brought the church back to the basic where it started. It's all about Jesus. <laughs> I laughingly, boy, you should have heard me writing this sermon. At one point I got really excited. And I, I said to myself, it's all about Jesus. And how do I know it's all about Jesus? Because the Bible tells me so. So don't start singing that little kid's hymn. Start looking at the little kid's hymns. They're the ones that tell you the deal. How do I know it's all about Jesus? Because the Bible tells me so. The church is Jesus here on earth. And it's built on the teachings, not on rules and sacraments or rituals. Um, not at all. Not at all. We're his, we're his followers. We are the followers of Jesus. Just like the 12 leaving Jerusalem. We're his disciples and his apostles and his feeders and his healers. And his comforters and his peacemakers. We are all of those for Jesus. And he told us how to be all of those things. How to do all of those things. The Bible tells us, it's in the scriptures, it's in his very words. And even as we do work for Christ, even as we do his work, which we do because he asks us to, we are not justified and saved by those words and deeds, but by the grace of God because we have faith in Jesus. Now, we are living in some really unusual times right now. 
most, I mean, all over the world. I, I mean, it's like, who ever thought about war? But here it is, it's all over the place. We thought we were behind that. But there, there's overt aggression and there are people dying on battlefields every day. And there are people dying from persecution and there are people dying from hunger and we're thinking, my gosh, is this really 2024? 20, and yeah, it is. In, in this country, in our country, there is an unleashed campaign of division and hatred and talk about those others and talk about those people and they're not like us and they are evil. You hear it, I know you hear it. And I'm telling you this morning, don't look away. Don't look away from that. Look it in the eye and confront it. You're a Christian. There is nothing Christ-like about those words or those actions. Nothing. Nothing. Nothing Christ-like about some of the behaviors that we've seen. Nothing. Jesus doesn't know the meaning of the word those people. He doesn't. And he didn't teach us to hate. He did not, and he condemns that. In these times of the division and the uncertainty and the anxiety, I ask you to listen to the spirit within you. Listen to the spirit within you. Jesus told us there would be false teachers. He told us there would be false prophets. And he told us they would use his name. He was right. He was right. I hear people say things in Jesus' name I hear people invoke Jesus' name so falsely. I hear ministers, I hear Christians misuse the words and teachings of Jesus, and it makes me sick. And I shudder. Don't look away. I ask you, I implore you to please stay connected to Jesus his words. Stay connected to Jesus. Stay connected to his teachings. Stay grounded in your faith. I'm going to tell you right now, there's no man-made, no man-made situation that changes the teachings of Jesus. I don't care who says it to you. There's no man-made situation that changes what Jesus taught us. Changes his truth, changes his commandments to love God and love each other. As Christians, we need to stand up and not allow people to corrupt our faith, to corrupt his gospel, his truth. The essence of our faith is love. Don't forget that. God's forgiving love through his son, the gift of his son, Jesus Christ who asked us and taught us to love one another. That's who you are as a Christian. That's your charge. It's all about Jesus. It's all about Jesus. It always has been and it always will be. So hold tight to that. Hold tight to that. Hold tight to his promises and his grace. Find strength in his love. For Jesus is indeed the way, the truth, and the life, now and forever. Thanks be to God. Amen. Will you join me in singing hymn number 442, The Church's One Foundation?
let us now declare what it is that we believe by repeating together the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he arose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. Let us bow our heads in prayer. And this prayer is adapted from a prayer by John Knox. Honor and praise be to you, O Lord our God, for all the tender mercies you have again given to us through another week. Continual thanks be to you for creating us in your own likeness, for redeeming us by the precious blood of your dear Son when we were lost and for sanctifying us with the Holy Spirit. For your help and support with our needs, your protection in the many dangers of body and soul, your comfort in all our sorrows, and for sparing us in life and giving us so long a time to repent. We thank you. O God of all power, you have called from death the great shepherd of the sheep, our Lord Jesus. Comfort and defend the flock which you have redeemed. Increase the number of true pastors. Relieve and enlighten the heart of the weak. Erase the pains of the afflicted. And especially of those who suffer for their witness to the truth. Give us an increase of hope and love. Together with a careful keeping of all your commandments. That no hardness of heart no hypocrisy, no lust of the eyes, nor any methods of the world may draw us away from obedience to you. And since we now live in these most precious times, let your providence defend us against all violence and harm. May we pray now that you would grant this request, that you would never allow us to grow so callous as to forget your many blessings but rather imprint and fix them firmly in our hearts that we may grow and increase daily more and more in true faith. Even as we wait for the coming of your kingdom, as we pray, as Jesus taught us, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Gracious God, may we, may we freely give with grateful and generous hearts as we bring forth our tithes and offerings and share what you have so graciously given to us. merciful God, we thank you for your indescribable gift of Jesus Christ. As we present our offerings today, give us grateful and generous hearts that we may always follow Jesus in what we say and do. 
Help us to remember that every generous act of giving and every perfect gift is from above, from you, our Heavenly Father. Amen. Will you join me in our closing hymn? It is number 482. Praise the Lord the Almighty. It's 482 in the blue. Christ and the abiding, redeeming, refreshing presence of the Holy Spirit be with you this day and every day. Amen. choices, be particular, and take care of yourselves, and if you can, take care of someone else. Have a great week. This session is meeting in the adult Bible class. <laughs>